Design is thinking made visual. Saul Bass. It's easy for one of the most influential designers of our time to focus on visual, but I think design has a larger scope. Design is thinking made real. I'm Leah Alcantara, and as visual design director at 10UP, I'm regularly challenged to take this abstract idea and concept into a workable reality. And thus, our design alignment workshop was born. And the workshop is named that way because that's exactly what we are trying to achieve, to gain alignment with our clients' needs and their audience goals. These workshops focus on the research phase, where we take our clients through divergent and then convergent thinking using techniques like a design principle walkthrough to validate their brand messaging and to use it as a reference throughout the entire workshop, reminding the team what their North Star is. A design spectrum exercise that gets everyone using the same words to describe the same thing. Because one person's bold is another person's boring. Then design shopping, which is how we find the best fit or best design approach using tangible website examples so that your imagination doesn't have to take too large of a leap to understand where we might take your site. It also validates or challenges assumptions made during the design spectrum exercise. And when we created these workshops, we did it expecting most of it would happen in person and always will. That's why all the screens you've just seen were the result of a real in-person design workshop. So raise your hand if like me, you've had to rapidly change your entire approach due to our new remote work and remote learning realities. But we're all problem solvers here. Otherwise, you wouldn't be attending this talk. So for today, let's provide you with some tips on how to adapt with our new reality with tactical takeaways and a different positive outlook to running online workshops. Let's start there. Benefits of remote workshops. Believe it or not, there are a ton of benefits to remote workshops. Do you have a very loud, very opinionated colleague that may drown out other voices in a room? You're in luck. Remote workshops can help redirect that energy to be more equitable. Because there is an equalizing aspect when everyone's thumbnail size is the same and they're essentially randomized on your screen. There's a power to that anonymity. A lot of people may decide to have their cameras turned off. Some people consider this a negative, but there are benefits to this for facilitating online workshops. In a workshop where no one knows whose cursor it is, then colleagues, peers, students, teachers, bosses, their responses hold equal weight. For example, this box right beside mine is 10UP CEO John Ekman. He doesn't look more prominent, right, than the other people on the call and may even be easily looked over. Now, let's take a look at the digital version of our design spectrum exercise. We have no idea after a re-review whose colors are those. You can assign colors, of course, but I like to shake things up and have someone self-select. They will remember what color they chose during the workshop, but after we all re-review, the likelihood of that is going to be low unless you pre-select a person with their color. That means you don't know whose dot the main stakeholder is, and you can see where groups have either clearly converged and diverged visually. 
Anonymity means you may get more honest feedback, which is more productive, useful feedback, because people are less beholden to peer pressure or power dynamics. Then we have engaging introverts. We have to acknowledge that everyone has different energy and communication styles. Public speaking is often cited as someone's number one fear over even death, which means an online workshop can potentially lower anxiety and increase engagement. This allows people to communicate in both passive and active ways using not just voice, but text, chat, comments, stickies, and those who feel more safe typing than speaking. For example, TenUp was tasked to redesign the Washington University of St. Louis Library website, or WashU Library for short. Now, it might be no surprise to anyone that a group of people working in libraries lean more toward the quiet side, and the WashU Library group was no exception. The screen that I'm sharing you right now is an example of the design shopping exercise we ran with this particular group. Now, imagine needing to run a workshop with a naturally quiet group. You may still get engagement, of course, but we could speculate that it would have been much harder because you're expecting them to speak in a way that is not natural for them. But because of the nature of online workshops, we were able to gather a lot of feedback in a way that took advantage of that group's communication style, reading and writing, meeting them where they were, then forcing them to adapt to our comfort level. Let me repeat that, meeting them where they were, then forcing them to adapt to our comfort level. That's what empathy looks like in action. Plus, as you may be able to see in this example, the other major benefit of online workshops is that there's automatic documentation. While you still need to potentially call on your team to write notes or help facilitate an online workshop, the participatory aspects of online workshops allow multiple people to take ownership of documenting their perspective. Plus, more often than not, an online workshop is recorded. I mean, imagine an on-site workshop with a camera pointed at your face or even a small phone. Doesn't that feel awkward? Wouldn't that lead to self-censoring? When these workshops are recorded on something like Zoom, it feels further away. And in addition, many services allow for auto or manual transcription that makes it easy for later review, like this talk. Plus, if you're using online whiteboarding tools like Miro or Mural, sticky notes are literally saved live and do not have to be photographed, re-annotated, or created. This actually helps engagement as people are not juggling multiple priorities or having to memorize things that are said in the moment. Speaking of things said in the moment, another great thing about documentation is that people naturally pause to think before they write. In person, people feel compelled to say the first thing that comes to mind, while adding moments of silence can truly get people to be more thoughtful. The other helpful aspect of workshopping online truly is the visual aspect of a design workshop. You can zoom in and out. Being able to see at a glance what the collective team opinion is visually, before, after, what's popular, what's not popular. It's important to note these workshops are not only validating what's important, but to validate what to avoid, see how obvious what the team really dislikes. Automatic documentation also helps when there's multiple meetings and engagements. It allows you a place to track and review past conversations and opinions in one place not only that, 
in a visual context. With the University of St. Thomas newsroom, we adapted the design alignment workshop as a framework beyond the discovery phase. But during our production phase, as a way to validate, then record our team's progress for the client to clearly see. You may see in this screen formal comments instead of stickies. At this point, we are heavy in design production. We might want to remove all anonymity and understand who is leaving feedback. This removes the ambiguity of decision making, plus it also helps onboard new stakeholders to a project as turnover is something to also keep in mind during this entire process. Now, before we get into the specifics of creating engaging online workshops, we cannot ignore some logistical items that should not be breezed through when preparing for remote engagement, such as always have a brief agenda, find out how many people are attending, because that will determine whether you need breakout rooms or talk helpers. But let's talk proactive technical prep. You need to immediately gauge the technological comfort of your workshop audience. This may seem obvious, but it's not something that many facilitators take into more serious consideration. Make sure you set up the activities based around those facts. It's the difference between being a technical support talk versus a productive design workshop. This means probing ahead if anyone has used the software you'll be running that day and their comfort level setting up a baseline level of what equipment or internet connection they need to have ready for the workshop and then sending those requirements ahead of time. And even at the beginning of the workshop, verify everyone's understanding. If you don't do that, you may be interrupted mid-workshop to ask a very basic question. Know that all your prep emails are probably going to be skimmed, so be prepared to set aside at least 10 minutes so that you can be that technical support person and plan to adjust your workshop as needed. If this level set doesn't need to happen, well, great. You have an extra 10 minutes for the meat of your workshop, but have a contingency plan for losing that time. This is why our alignment workshops actually have quick tutorials on Miro basics. We sometimes even send these boards ahead of time to help basic orientation with the client's team. Plus, anyone else who may need to reorient post-workshop and wanting to add further feedback later. And then let's talk about your presentation prep. Now for your own tech prep, you know, I'm not gonna reiterate these basics, common things, right? Um, to ensure the best experience. Um, but one thing that a lot of people seem to forget is to turn off any background syncing happening. It siphons away precious internet speed. That means pause syncing or close completely Dropbox, Google Drive, or the Adobe Creative Cloud app. Next, make sure chat windows are open and easily accessible. This has bit me myself during a presentation because Zoom chats are auto hidden when you share your screen. So you should make sure that it's still visible so you can view reactions and review questions as they come. Make sure your internal team Slack or Teams is also open to the side if you need to privately Remember, privately discuss something happening live on the call. And whatever software you use, I encourage grid or gallery view. Try to have as much of your audience visible so you can play off of them. Make sure you have it set up because it's not by default at times so you can see their names. Oftentimes, you may need to casually throw in participants' names out, so you make sure you rotate through the participants. Level set to the entire team that we'd like them to be on camera at all times. And 
pin or rearrange your grid blocks so that major stakeholders or your talk helpers, if you've assigned them, are easily visible to you. Focusing on crucial attendees means you can help eliminate the feeling of every grid being overwhelming. Now, this may seem obvious to break your workshop into discrete chunks with specific needs and outcomes. You also have to do that in person uh, for sure. But for example, when we ran the California DMV design shopping exercise, we had a vast number of websites to talk through. This is around 20 websites. If you wanna be technical, if you actually are counting the screens, it's 19, sure. Why? So why did we have 20 websites? Because when you have these interactions in person, people can absorb more information and also are able to look at the larger picture more easily. Now, when we run this workshop online, we have maybe six, ideally five, websites to walk through. That's because again, we're fighting with attention plus different levels of ability. And I'm not just talking about technical ability. In person, everyone knows how to take a sticker, or place it on a piece of paper, and frankly, if someone struggles with that in person, we can immediately help out. But in an online workshop, watch how people of different ages, ability, attention spans, technical understanding, and even internet speed struggle to copy paste a green dot or to point an, to an area on a screen. I've seen this happen enough times, and even with those that I suspect are actually technically savvy, simply because they're distracted or say, imagine this scenario and some of you in this room is probably doing this, balancing their laptop on their knees in the living room. Knowing these limitations means you need to scale back your expectations for how much interactivity you may actually get. That means editing your workshop down to its core elements. Now, we've gotten logistics out of the way. It's time to tackle one of the most crucial parts of an online workshop. While I've outlined a lot of benefits with remote workshops that doesn't remove the very real, very obvious drawback, the ability to command and keep attention. You'll have a full screen where your audience only hears your voice because the browser window or slide takes up the whole experience or a grid view where your face is a small box by surrounded by other small boxes. And on top of that, many people customize their view so you have actually no idea what they're looking at. Full screen, boxes, who knows? We spoke about the benefits of those small thumbnails, but that doesn't mean ignoring the very real reality and the very real communication obstacles we need to overcome. The reality that 80% of all communication is nonverbal, 35% is vocal or tone of voice, and 45% facial expressions and body posture, mannerisms, body language, all of the above affects how information is being interpreted. So a major benefit of in-person workshops, the face-to-face -face interaction is severely limited. It's much harder to read the room. It's much easier for you and your audience to get distracted and much harder to be more engaging. I'm talking about that happening right now while you're listening to this talk. Are you checking Twitter's explore page? Is work pinging you on Slack? Is Gmail open on another screen? Come on, fess up. Now, you'd think since we're presenting on a screen to other people's screens where it's literally focused on our face, that people will be able to truly absorb what you're trying to convey. But remember at the beginning, when I pointed out some of the drawbacks of video conferencing, you actually don't know if they have your video screen pinned or focused, or maybe they're looking at your slides and you're a small thumbnail face or distracted by something else. 
So you need to set expectations and boundaries. For example, level set that this will be an interactive workshop and people may be called to participate. If you don't do that, some of them may incorrectly think that this will just be a presentation where they can passively listen. This has happened to me when I have not level set this. While everyone should be open to participate in a workshop that's best for them, ask participants if they're comfortable to have their camera on. This allows you to check engagement or lack thereof, and also gives you the ability to gauge reactions. When you see someone nod or smile during a presentation, you know they're having a good time, or are amused, or are indicating agreement without saying a word. So as much as you can, do encourage your audience to keep their camera on, unless there's a good reason not to. Sometimes what helps is to set up interactions and questions that requires the audience body language to participate. For example, raise your hand if you struggle to adapt to remote work like I did at the beginning of this presentation. Once you've set up these expectations, you need to bring up your energy. Put yourself in the shoes of a theater actor, right? They have to project and emote and move so that people in the far second balcony can have a great experience. And you can start with your voice, especially online. That is your greatest strength. Project, get a good mic, and practice your voice inflection for dramatic effect. That includes appropriate pauses, lowering your voice to convey seriousness, or increasing your volume to convey excitement. And since we're talking audio, have you considered adding music to your workshop, especially when you're in the midst of a timed feedback session? A chill piece of music can get everyone relaxed and a more upbeat piece of music can actually move things forward. Choose what makes most sense for your workshop. Next, consider the frame. Don't be afraid to take up the entire camera's frame and use it. Physically, zoom in and out by moving closer or farther from the camera. Change your posture. Lean back on your chair to show some relaxation or thoughtful listening. Lean forward, indicating you're really engaged or plant your chin on your hand. It's called the thinking pose for a reason. Gestures are your friend. They immediately grab attention, plus they're also useful when making a point. An interesting paradox about working on websites is how much we actually use to rely on non-digital ways of working. The decks we create are digital, but are presented in person. The websites we want to review are digital, but we print them out because that's what's needed for in-person workshops or as a takeaway with a variety of stakeholders used to literal paperwork. So in many ways, we've been adapting our digital way of work to in-person dynamics. What I'd like to leave you all with is perhaps our remote work realities are actually better opportunities for us to truly engage in the digital space we work. Plus, we're now communicating using the means we eventually want our audiences to engage in, online. So I welcome you all to embrace the chaos. Thank you so much.